Here we are for our fourth and our final on what did the Bible say about slavery. Let's, um, I hope you've, if you're not listening to the other three, you're, you're going to have no clue here. So please listen to those. They're almost exactly 20 minutes each. Uh, that's a huge investment. Thank you for taking all the time that you do to tune in, to listen, to support by giving, uh, and also to support by subscribing, which is just a huge encouragement on whatever platform, whether you're on podcast, YouTube, Vimeo, uh, Facebook uh, Live, however you do this, we, we love having you be a part of us. So remember this, and this hasn't been brought up in this, in this series yet, but remember your Old Testament. The land was given to the 12 tribes, and I'm aware those numbers moved around a little bit, and their designations moved a bit, but the land they were given was to be held in perpetuity forever. The borders weren't to be moving about, and therefore uh, that's why that law of Jubilee was put into effect, whether or not it was actually ever done to restore everything every 49th year. Everything goes back, reset. Because of this, it was very hard for foreign people to establish themselves in Israel in any permanent basis, except many that entered as slaves immediately were assimilated or very quickly were. Think of Rahab, Ruth, Uriah, the Hittite, who worked for David. David mistreated him and ended up getting him killed. Uriah was the noble one in that story. Um, again, outside, uh, Obed Edom, the Gittite, um, Etai, the Gittite, these are both in um, Samuel, 2 Samuel 6 and 2 Samuel 15. Um, there is Arana, the, or, see, Arauna, the Jeb Jebusite in 2 Samuel 24. There are others that were slaves, foreigners, but as soon as they were bought, they were then treated as family, people of covenant. That's the way we ended last week, so I'm hoping that you've already heard those. God constantly, I, I didn't do an exhaustive count, but came up with well over a dozen times where God ex expressly says, you cannot mistreat slaves, even if they're foreigners, they must be treated with love, with hospitality, and with respect. They have rights and rules and that runaway slaves were not to be returned. If they ran away, it was likely for a reason. So now we come to the New Testament. And the laws and the, and the mentions in the New Testament change very much because God in the Old Testament was making the law of the land. In the New Testament, he's making a law for his people. The law of the land is the Greco-Roman law. And in that, that system, they had slavery very well regulated. By well, I mean completely not good. It was not good, it was just completely regulated. A slave could not represent themselves in legal matters. They very often had no legal standing. Um, and in other words, they, they could not bring a case against anyone who was higher than them in the, the entire community, no matter what that person did. Uh, they did not really have rights they were subject to arrest, torture, um, in ways that free people were not. Their occupation was decided by their master. They had no, uh, no say. They had to live where their master lived and they were slaves until death or until that family sold them on. In Roman society, however, this may surprise you, slaves could own other slaves. A slave might make enough money working you know, uh, at a house to buy their own slave. They, slavery was not based upon racial things, color of skin. It was all about who was where in Roman society. Uh, there were many, many, many degrading, awful things about Roman society and about their view of slaves. However, in their law, slaves had more rights than in most ancient peoples, um, countries. Uh, so again, the law said, but your life as a slave, it really depended upon who bought you. 
and what they did with you. And if they died and left you into the family to another member, how they treated you. It, it was a very, very precarious life. Um, some, however, were treasured and loved. For example, in Luke 7, we have a man coming to Jesus to ask Jesus to heal his slave because he loved him so much. He, the slave was a member of the family and he was heartbroken that his slave was sick. The situation with New Testament um, mentions leave us wishing there was more. We wish that God would have just said, no slavery, stop it all, pull down the governments that are supporting it. But that's no what happened. Um, instead, it is you be these kind of people and you love one another. It is a slow rolling revolution, but it is a revolution nonetheless. Christian slaves are expressly um, mentioned and addressed in places like Ephesians chapter 6. We'll get to that on the Wednesdays here fairly soon. Verses 5 through 9, Colossians 3, uh, 22 through 25. Um, 1 Peter 2 is uh, troublesome. 1 Peter 2, I'm, 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 18 through 25. I'm thinking about it again. Sorry, guys, I got it wrong. It's 1 Peter 2. I was right the first time. 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 25. And in all of these passages, what is, ex what is uh, stressed? Be obedient to the masters. Serve faithfully as an act of obedience to God. And that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear you should you know, escape and be free because you're free in Christ. That just wasn't realistic. It couldn't happen. Where are they going to go? And what's going to happen to them when they're found? For they will be found. Travel was not easy. Privacy didn't really exist because anywhere you went, there were eyes on you. People were clumped together. People were on the roads. So God says, you just be obedient and be kind and loving as if you're doing it to God. Was that you know, weak soup? No, not really. Um, Paul talks about people in Caesar's own household who were Christians and who were reaching others in high positions. How'd they do that? They were probably slaves who were converts and then who taught others, not just slaves, but family members. Because slaves, by the way, were almost always the teachers for wealthy families. They would bring them in because the slaves knew how to read and write. They knew theology. They knew because uh, theology was required for a well-educated uh, individual even among pagan societies. Um, there was, uh, they would know philosophy, they would know natural sciences, they would know different languages. So slaves would be teachers. Well, they would also share their faith whenever they had that opportunity. Uh, first Peter is in particular, uh, first Peter chapter two, is in particularly addressed to slaves who are being mistreated. And again, he talks about you endure suffering. God, is, God sees it. God will sort this out. I had a, a, a gentleman send me a, a, an email or a comment. I don't always read the comments um, because it's one of the rule rules of the internet is don't read the comments, but I do see some. But so, I can't remember whether it was through a messenger or however, but he reached out when we looked at, in Romans at the state bearing the sword and like, and he said, so knowing all of this, how do we justify the American Revolution? And I just wrote back and said, I don't. And it's not just because I'm Scottish and it's not just because, you know, I'm picking a team here. I don't believe God's given us the right to say, you know, I've had enough. You're allowed now to shoot your policemen and shoot your military. I just don't think that's the way God gets things done. Well, does that mean then that we may suffer injustice? Yes, but so did he. And he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he told us to do what he did. I know, sometimes I wish it was different. I wish every day um, when, I'm, when I'm not thinking, I wish every day were Elijah on Mount Carmel day 
where we could just make fun of the falseness and bring down fire and destroy it. Problem is, if we read our scripture, we realize we're part of the falseness. And so eventually our turn to get burned up, you don't want that. You don't want a world and a religion based upon vengeance. So, and if you're right now screaming, well, what about hell? I did a whole Monday series on that one. Go back and check. There's one book in the Bible that is addressed to a Christian slaveholder, Philemon. It's short and it's beautiful. It really is. Onesimus is the slave who's run away. Well, somehow he is a Christian. Now, whether he was a Christian before he left, I, I think he became a Christian later. Paul is writing a letter sending Onesimus back to Philemon because that was the law. But he's telling Philemon, listen, you treat him as your brother because he's my brother. And then said, if this has hurt you financially, remember again, debt was a big part of, of much of this. I don't know with Onesimus what his situation was. He said, if he's hurt you financially, you let me know and I'll pay. Between you and me, um, there's no way Philemon's ever going to send a bill to Paul. I think Paul knows that too, saying, you know, if you can't handle it, if you just feel you've been wronged, I'll pay for that. That's a little humbling thing, isn't it? But the way Paul requested, it makes very, very plain. You treat this man as your brother. Um, there are a couple of mentions in script in the New Testament of something that we would say that's akin to the slavery of the antebellum south of the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul lists enslavers as uh, among the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, and the sinners. So he, people who make this their living to go get slaves, absolutely, it was condemned. Um, you also, in Revelation 18 and verse 13, once again, practicing what is contrary to, um, to human, doc to sound doctrine, are people called those trading in slaves. So for us, we look and say, you know, I, I wish the scripture would have been different, but I wish the ancient world would have been different. And to be fair, I wish this world was different. But in all of these, what the Bible did was lay down laws of brotherhood, freedom, and to allow temporary um, slavery to pay off debts. There was no economic collapse. You could continue. The person then could leave with a good business starter kit from the master. And when it was done according to the way God wanted it done, it worked beautifully. When it wasn't, it didn't. There's a lesson in there for us. We're going to leave this one as a shorter lesson today. And I hope, however, that that doesn't bother you at all. It'll be more like a 14 minute one. But thank you again. Please subscribe. Give if you can. But if a church is leading and feeding you where you are, they probably need your money there. But keep your prayers going for us. Next week, wow, well, we're going to start something new. What is our Bible? How do we get it? And what do we do with it? I think the answers might surprise you. But they're going to have to wait. We'll see you next Monday.